All right, you made it to the last lesson, lesson nine. We're going to be talking about the Great Commission. Uh, we have two more weeks of class, but this is our last lesson in the book because the last two weeks uh, are actually really important. Don't, don't, don't leave now. Um, the last two weeks are where we get to download together. We've, we've, we've gone through a pretty good range of what the Bible teaches, and so in the last couple of weeks, what we'll be doing is both having a kind of question and, and dialogue about things that are on your mind, uh, and then also... We're going to give you a chance to be able to share where you got to with your personal learning question and your um, your person you were hoping to reach. And so you don't have to. We're not going to go around and poll everybody and interrogate everybody, but uh, we will hear from people, and that's actually really helpful. Um, those question and answer times are always, um, I think, always really a fruitful thing. Um, and, and really at the, the last couple of weeks is where we kind of get a good – uh, sense of where everybody's at now and 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 where people are in their thinking now as opposed to in the beginning, uh, which is all important. But for right now, we're going to talk about the Great Commission. This is coming off of last time where we talked about the world. So we talked about the world in two ways. Now we're going to throw one more meaning of world to you. So again, I'm using the New Testament term cosmos or cosmos uh, to talk about the world. In the Greek mind, in the, in the, in the New Testament mind, that word had a diff couple different meanings to it. The first one we saw was God's ordered and created good world. We talked about nature and creation. The second was the, the, the system of the world. And we, we're, we're, if we look in the Bible, we see kind of two almost conflicting things. The Bible tells us not to love the world or the things of the world. Uh, James says to love the things of the world is to be at enmity or be an enemy uh, of God. But then we know the most famous verse in the Bible is John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world. And you're like, man, how come God is telling me don't love the world? And then I'm reading God loves the world. Well, there's a third meaning of this, uh, this word cosmos, this word world, and that is the people of the world, the people of the world. And that's what we're going to talk about here with the Great Commission. Uh, and so are we to love uh, the world system? No, the world system has been corrupted, but are we to love the people of the world? Yes, yes, God loves them. We love them as well. Now, that begs the question, if you're, if you're you know, thinking about this, didn't the people of the world who we're supposed to love create the system of the world that we're not supposed to love? You could take it that way. Um, and I want to try to kind of address that a little bit here and include a phrase that we often use, which is um, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. Uh, it's been used a lot, but is that the most helpful phrase? Is it the most helpful motivation to be able to see people that way and just try to separate those two things out the sin from the sinner the the act from the person um so I, i'd like you to read through this i wrote it as carefully as i could uh, this caused a lot of stir when i first put it in here um, and so i've edited it to try to help it be understandable and helpful and not uh not derail anybody in their thinking um but it says here at the bottom of 153, just as it is impossible to really separate the people of the world from the value system of the world, right? Who holds those values? It's, it's the people. It is impossible to separate sin from people who are sinners. A small view of sin comes from a small view of God and leads to a small view of his grace. So if we really, if we go back to lesson three, we talked about people and we talked about sin, not lesson three, sorry, lesson four. Um, we really need to see that sin is no small thing. It is no joke. It is spitting in the face of Almighty God. It is a big, big deal, okay? So when we understand that, we'll understand that uh, grace then, as we learned about in, in, in the fifth lesson, grace is a big, big deal. That God would have grace on us is a huge thing because it cost li always costs life. The Bible always describes sin uh, and death together, and then life and righteousness together. And so the wages of sin, Romans uh, 3 tells us, is death. The, the, the payment for sin is death. Sin always equals in some way a death, a falling away from God who is our life, our source of life. And so we can't, we can't just make light of sin, and I'm not trying to do that. But that is an approach that often gets used even by Christians 
where we, we would kind of say, well, you know, we want, we, you know, God loves you. And so we kind of jump to that, skip over the sin part and just want people to really feel good. And if they'll feel good enough and they'll, they'll know Jesus is nice enough, then they will want to put their faith in him. But that doesn't really lead to repentance. Repentance is that turning away from sin and turning to the Lord. It's, it's confessing that you need God's forgiveness. And we don't get there unless we really understand that each of us individually has sinned against him. And if we're going to take the Bible and take the gospel to others, it doesn't help them to uh, skirt the issue of, of sin. That's different from, in style, really when we talk about like Bible thumping and, and trying to shove the gospel down their throats and just, you know, rail at people for how sinful they are. The issue is not how sinful they are. We're all, we're all sinners. It, the, the, the details are less important than realizing that if I've sinned even once in any way, I've tried to push God off his throne and put myself there and live as my own God. And so I need his forgiveness for that. That's the bottom line. And so we want to be honest about sin, but beating people doesn't really help. Uh, what really helps, the, the Bible says that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And so we want to present his kindness, but we also present the truth of how kind he is, is seen in, how loving he is, even though we are sinful, right? Um, so sometimes we, we might look for kind of ways out and, well, you know, people, they, they suffer and so they sin or bad things happen in society and so that causes people sin. Um, we we want to be able to agree with the Bible where it holds us responsible. I want to make a side note to this lesson, though, on this point. The Bible also describes that, yes, society as a whole is corrupt. And we talked about that last time. So let's not discount that when we talk about what's what's wrong and what happens to people and why is the world messed up, okay? So we don't always want to see just individual sin as the only, the only reason that people suffer. People suffer because originally sin brought in suffering, but that doesn't mean that their particular, we've talked about this before, that their particular sin is leading to their particular suffering in their particular life. The second thing that I want to say is that as we talked uh, last week about uh, the devil and demons, there is demonic influence and demonic oppression in people's lives that causes suffering and harm. Uh, and so I, 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 I want to kind of be able to say, hey, the problems, historically what the church has said is the problems are the world, the flesh, and the devil, meaning the world system, corrupt as it is, my own flesh and my own, my own predilection to sin, and then the devil influencing us away from God. Okay, so it's those three things, the world, the flesh, and the devil. But we're really talking here about the flesh, the people of the world. And so we want to be careful, again, not to, not to downplay sin, because if we downplay sin, we're actually downplaying God's grace for sin, and we're downplaying also God's justice and judgment on sin. And so if you read through this, it's carefully worded, but the bottom line is God takes sin super, super seriously to the point where he uses the word hate uh, towards a sinner. Does that mean that God, God hates everybody who, who, who sins against him? Well, not really, but when their intention is against him, his intention is against them, John Piper says. That he, uh, he uh, the Bible says that God desires to do good to us, but he also, uh, he also will have his, his justice and his righteousness. And so when we sin and sin against others, God will have righteousness and justice. So how does he have both of these things? Well, we talked about salvation in Lesson 5. And so how does God both ha keep, his, he keep his justice perfect and his mercy perfect? Well, he pours his wrath and justice out on Jesus so that he can pour his mercy out on those who say, Jesus, take my justice for me, right? And then we become people of mercy and justice to others. So then when we turn our, our, our eyes on those who still are not yet believers, are not transformed by God, don't have faith in Christ, um, we don't then look at them and, and, and look at them with either only unmixed mercy, oh, you poor thing, you're just a victim, nor do we look at them with only unmixed justice, 
ah, God is going to smite you. He didn't smite me because I'm the best. I believed in him, but he's going to crush you. No, we turn to them with the same eyes God turned to us with, eyes of mixed mercy and justice. Those terms, by the way, are constantly connected in the Bible, mercy and justice. Uh, sometimes it's presented as mercy and truth. In the New Testament, it tells us to speak the truth with grace and love. And so these things are always mixed. The Bible tells us in, in 1 John that if our heart condemns us, God knows our heart. Uh, sorry, God knows all things. And uh, I think where we could take he knows all things is he knows our heart. So he knows why it's condemning us. He knows the sin that's there, but he also knows what he's done for us on the cross. And so we have to then, we have to look at people and ask God to help us look at people with those same eyes of mercy and truth, mercy and justice, grace and love, always, always together, uh, so that we're we're honest about their sin, but we're also honest about what God has done about it, okay? Um, all right. So a question for you to reflect on, is it more difficult for you to come to terms with God's mercy or God's wrath? 155, page 155, that's on. Why do I ask that? Because we tend to lean one way or the other. We tend, even as Christians, to lean towards thinking of God as this very grumpy, wrathful God who uh, hates any hint of anything wrong. And some of us take it to the point where if we don't speak out about everything we see as wrong all the time, God might come for us next. Then the other side of that, the other end of that spectrum, is that we have a hard time thinking of God as loving and merciful. We have a hard time with the idea that he would forgive me. And we have a hard time with the idea that he would easily, not easily forgive, but he would freely forgive others. Um, and so we tend, to, we tend to really struggle with one, or one of those two. And that's going to lead to a way that we're going to struggle to share the gospel with others will either lean on being overly kind of condemning or will be overly uh, easy and give kind of this very easy grace where um, sin almost gets erased. God's just here to solve your problems and make you feel nice and happy. Uh, and neither of those are the truth. The truth is in the middle where we, again, mix this perfect mix of mercy, God loves you, grace, look how uh, uh, righteousness, look how much he loves you, He's a righteous God who is willing to pour his righteousness, uh, his righteous judgment out on Jesus. Okay. Um, all right. Moving down a little bit on page 156. This is maybe a little bit technical, but it's really important. Um, if we take the Bible as a whole story, we start with the first thing God told Adam and Eve, which was be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Then we, we, we jump uh, later in the story and we see the last thing that Jesus told his disciples, which was before he left, which was, Behold, all things have been put under my feet. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, is that technically the last thing that he told them? Not necessarily. But it's what we have as, as at the end of Matthew, as, as what we call the Great Commission Statement. There's actually Great Commission Statements in, in the other Gospels and Acts as well. This one um, is what I'm going to look at here. What I'm getting at is it's the last command we have from Jesus. That's what I'm going to say. It's the last command. So did he make some other comment after that? Probably. But this is the last command that we have from him. And so... Where I want to go with that is that the two link up. So if you, um, I'm a color-coded kind of person, uh, this may drive you nuts. Some people say they don't like it. Uh, but page 156 at the bottom there, I want to compare these two statements. So back in Genesis 128, God blessed Adam and Eve, right? God blessed them and God said to them, in Matthew 28, Jesus, God, in the flesh, came and said to them. In Genesis 128, he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In Matthew 28, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So they're supposed to be fruitful and multiply what in Genesis? Children. They're supposed to have a lot of children. That's how they're going to multiply worshipers of God. Because at this point, 
people are, 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 are morally innocent. And so they're able to, uh, if they had a lot of children, they'd have a lot of morally innocent children who had this, this wonderful relationship with God. In Matthew, what are they supposed to multiply? Not children, but disciples. Um, really interestingly, I was, I was looking through kind of a, uh, a description of audiobooks the other day, and I found one that was making the case. I didn't, I didn't buy this, uh, literally or figuratively buy it. Um, but it was talking about how, um, because the population of, um, I want to get it right, but I think it was the population of the U S is more religious than non-religious and more Christian than non-Christian that because they'll have, oh no, that's what it was because the, because conservative Christian families tend to have more children, they will, there will be a Christian resurgence in, in the U S because less Christian families and couples tend to have lower birth rates. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. That is calling for us to, if we have enough children, you're a Christian because you're born into a Christian home. Now, you have a better chance, right? You have a bit more influence on you of becoming a Christian if you are in a Christian home with that influence. But this book was sort of saying, um, if we get the right kind of people to have a lot of children, we will outnumber the wrong kind of people. And I was like, whoa, no, that's not at all how, how Jesus told us to multiply the church that's taking that Genesis mentality of multiply children, but now that doesn't work anymore because guess what? They did multiply a lot of children, but that's how the world got all corrupted was a bunch of corrupt children, right? That's taking this old, 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 Old Testament strategy and command and then trying to force it into our world now, which doesn't work. How do we multiply the church now? We talked about the invisible church in lesson, uh, I believe it was six, when we talked about the church, And we said that ultimately you're only a real Christian, not because you identify with Christians or go to church or from a Christian tribe or a Christian family or a Christian country, quote unquote, as though there were such a thing. Um, You're a Christian because you have desperate faith in Jesus and you follow his lordship in your life. So how do we multiply? We multiply through sharing the gospel and, and having people become disciples themselves of Jesus, right? So I hope you see the difference there. Uh, so what worked in Genesis does not work in Matthew. What worked in, in before the fall of man does not work after. And so here Jesus is saying, yeah, multiply, but multiply disciples. Okay. Uh, in Genesis 1, he tells them to have dominion over the earth, to subdue the earth, right? In, in what does he say specifically? The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, every living thing. So this very literal dominion over nature. But in Matthew, Jesus isn't going to tell them to have dominion. He's going to tell them that he has authority and they should bring people under his authority. So in Matthew, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he tells them to go teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So now the authority is not about us having authority over the earth. It's really about Jesus having authority spiritually, and we bring people under his authority. But these two things are linked. The first command God gave us, uh, and the last one we have from Jesus before he, before he ascends to heaven, saying that he will return again. So what's important about that? This is the last thing that he said. This is the last thing that he said. Uh, if somebody were to, um, this, is, this is really vital here. If your boss at work or your, you know, the father of the, the, the household or whatever authority figure, the, 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 the commander on the battlefield, whatever it is, said, I'm going to leave. You don't know when I'm coming back, but by the time I, while I'm gone, you need to be, a, you need to be busy with this, right? Dad leaves home and says, um, I'll be back later, kids. And when I, when I'm, when I'm, when I come back, I want to see that you've been uh, cleaning the house. Um, that doesn't mean this isn't saying that you have to have the whole house clean, um, but you need to be busy about cleaning it. So we don't know when dad is coming back, but we don't want him to come back and find us not having done what he said or sat around and talked a lot about what is, what do you think he meant? And what part of the house should we clean first? And how clean do you think clean means? And, um, what, what chemicals should we use to clean the house and who's going to do the counters and who's going to do the floor? 
those conversations might be useful if we're actually going to then do those things. Okay, you do the counter, you do the floor, and I'll do this. And make sure you do the counter first so the, the, the crumbs fall on the floor, and then I'll sweep them, and then you mop, and, and we'll, we'll... That would be fine, but it's not fine to sit around and talk about it and not do it. I hope you get that analogy. Because with Jesus, when he says, I'm going away, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'm going to go be busy preparing a place for you in heaven. Meanwhile, you stay here and you uh, you take the gospel to all people groups, all nations. Um, and we're like, mm, no, no, I, I just want to read my Bible while you're gone. That's not what he said to do. That's not what he said to do. And if we really are, you know, studying our word, then we have to come to this place where we go, I guess I better do what it says. So on that note, when we talk about the Great Commission, we really do believe, and if you've noticed at our church, we really do believe this is um, not its own thing that is a, a, a nice thing for some Christians to get involved in, but rather this is something that all Christians are part of. This is our mission. This is what all of us are about because it's the last thing Jesus told us to be doing, okay? Um, so on that note, um, reflect. Think about this. Do you consider the Great Commission your commission? Do you consider that your mission? Why or why not? Are you part of making disciples of all the nations? Why or why not? Now, let's, let's break down uh, a couple of those phrases. So the first is make disciples. Discipleship, I define it pretty simply here as helping others follow Jesus along with us, meaning there's some relational aspect to it. You're following along with us. <clears throat> Some people would say discipleship happens if I, you know, mail you a book and we never talk again. Maybe, yeah, maybe. But I think there is a relational, you're, 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 you're become part of the church and you're following him along with the other believers. Um, and we're not helping you follow me. We're helping you follow Jesus, right? We're helping you, Jesus said, make disciples, right? Um, so we would do that. And then you become part of this process where you then, uh, you had a graph when we talked about the church, uh, about discipleship, where if we go full circle, you start making disciples as well. And so the disciples are making disciples who are making disciples, and, and the church goes viral. So that's what we're talking about when we make, talk about make disciples. This can look one of two ways, by the way. To help follow people follow Jesus could be to help them begin to follow Jesus in terms of an evangelistic kind of discipleship where you're you're teaching them what it is to follow him, um, maybe for the first time in their life. And then there's what we more typically talk about with discipleship, which is helping uh, people who are already following Jesus follow him better and more closely and, and teaching them to have others follow him as well. Uh, but discipleship can mean kind of all of that. There's some arguments within you know church circles about you know, is this discipleship, is that? Those are mainly arguments over style and strategy, not, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to get bogged down in those. I, I think it's okay to have lots of different ways that we help people follow Jesus. The strategy is not, uh, for instance, there are people who would say the only way to disciple people is to have them live with you, literally like move into your house and live with you. There are other people who discipleship is we meet at coffee once a week and we go through a book together and we check in each week and and, and, and mold life kind of more like maybe counseling. I'm all for both of those. Both of those can be great ways as long as we're teaching people to follow Jesus and help others follow him as well. Okay. But Jesus said, make disciples, not just make disciples over coffee, but he said, make disciples specifically, he says, of all the nations. This word nations in Greek is where we get our term ethnic group, ethnoi. Uh, ethnos is the singular, ethnoi is the plural. We, we talk about ethnic groups. The idea that we have of nations now when we talk about, you know, Nigeria and India um, are not what the Bible has in mind. That's a pretty recent phenomenon in church history to have these really big countries with a govern one government like that. What you had in biblical times were either these uh, little ethnic groups or an empire. What would happen is the empire would overtake uh, all these little ethnic groups um, and they would become part of that empire until another empire came along, but they would retain their ethnic identity. Um, and so our version now is very recent in history um, 
I mean, you look at even Italy. Italy uh, has only been the country we know for like, I think, 200 years. It was for a long time a bunch of different language groupings. And uh, there was a guy named Garibaldi whose whole thing was to make it one big country. But again, that's a very recent thing. Uh, and then, and then say we all speak Italian, one this one language, rather than all these. You know, there was Veneto, and there was um, I think uh, I, I could be wrong. I think Sicilian was one, and I can't remember them all. But there's all these uh, all these languages within it, um, within what we now call the one country of Italy. So that's not what we're talking about. Even with I mentioned the two examples of Nigeria and India, each of those have a ton of languages within them and a ton of cultures and people groups within them. We have a harder time with this in the U.S. because we're this melting pot where we all kind of get together um, and we, you know, uh, we have, you know, we have we share English, um, but it's a little bit difficult for us. We understand it a little bit better in terms maybe of Native American tribes, but that is such a um, we're kind of a unique thing. We're a very unique thing um, where imagine, you know, a country where there's tons of tribes and tons of groups and tons of languages spoken. Um, and Nigeria and India are great examples of that. So Jesus is saying, go and make disciples of all of these, all of, from of all of these groups. Why? Well, in Revelation 5 and Revelation 7, there's a, there's a prophecy that God will enjoy the worship of and, and, and his kingdom will involve um, representatives of, of all of these groups. And so we go to them. Um, on that note, as we go and take the Bible to other cultures, uh, remember when we talked about the Bible, I'm uh, sorry, in the church, and we said the Bible does not describe what church should be like in all this detail, which is great because over time and across uh, geography, the Bible can fit into any given culture because we bring, it brings principles of what it is to be the church without all the specifics of what that might look like in your culture. Um, I use the, the example of modesty as a biblical principle that was applied differently in the first century than it is now. And that's the same across the world. Modesty is different um, in, in different cultures. The principle remains the same. But the uh, but the 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 form of that, the way it looks, is going to be different. And so the Bible is is very workable into these different cultures. And not just that, but each one has a has something in that culture that they bring to the Bible. Let me give you an example. Um, in our culture in America, we like to organize things and we like to be very productive. I think we really get and resonate with and can model ourselves on when Jesus is feeding the 5,000 in John chapter 6, and he, he organizes them into groups of, you know, I think it's like tens and hundreds. I think maybe just hundreds. I don't remember the specifics. He organizes it, has the disciples go and organize them into groups, and then has them sit down. Boom, we get that. Organize your ministry. Uh, delegate to others. Have it be in order. Even the way that you help people in need should be done in, in a good order. We get that in, in American culture. Um, but what's harder for us in a, in a passage uh, like that is the idea that maybe we need a miracle in order to help people because we often think we can do it in our own strength. Where other cultures are, they don't have issues with miracles in the Bible. We sometimes were so scientific in our thinking that the idea of miracles just seems so outlandish. We, we, we sometimes try to get around them. I'm not saying our church in particular, but often the church in the U.S. Um, whereas in many cultures, the the miracle is is like the important part. I remember hearing a, a, a story of um, believers, and I can't remember which Asian country it was. Um, oh, maybe not even believers. It was missionaries witnessing to people in, in an Asian country, and they were telling a story of Jonah, and they were so nervous about telling this part about how he's swallowed for three days by this giant fish, and then he survives and is spit out on land, and they're like not wanting to talk about this and not wanting to go there because it begs these questions of, well, does that really happen? How does that happen scientifically? How does that work? You know, has that ever happened before? What kind of fish was this? Those are our Western ways of reading that story, and they they finish the 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 story of Jonah, and the people are you know they're talking and they're they're going back and forth, and they 
they, 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 well, we, we, we have a question. Did God really, did God really do that with the fish? And their thing was, if he did, if that was really the power of God, then that's a God worth following rather than this hang up on, but how could that be? So many cultures believe in, you know, uh, uh, the spiritual realm and they believe in miracles and we have a harder time with that. Um, and so they bring a strength then to a story like the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, likewise, in, in some cultures, hospitality, in a lot of cultures, hospitality is so much better practiced than in, in, in ours. And so talking about, you know, the, the, the early church and how we're supposed to care for the needs of one another and that the church was in people's homes is much, much more relatable to them where you and me in our culture, are my, but my house is my sanctuary and my stuff is my stuff and I worked hard to earn this stuff. That can be a tougher one uh, for us to come to terms with. Those are just examples. All I'm getting at is different cultures bring their understanding to the gospel and can help other churches and other cultures around the world understand and get and live the, the, the gospel better and will challenge one another on their thinking of it, okay? Um, all right. It's long been said that missionaries really are hurtful, that they, they go around and they're, they're, they just destroy and, and chew up people's cultures. And I give you a couple, a couple things here from an article by a guy named Robert Woodbury. Um, he is a professor in Texas. Um, and really, I thought that was just some helpful kind of rebuttal to that. But I would say there are lots of missionaries, we should be honest, there are missionaries historically who've done a very bad job of communicating God's love to people. Um, or communicating that the gospel is is bigger than any one culture. And so sometimes what they've done is they've exported um, maybe European culture and then European styles of church and clothing and, and all of that rather than exporting the gospel. But at the same time, you know, so many missionaries have done such good and really when we look historically, it's not the missionaries who are often guilty of that, it's colonists and colonizers who are coming to maybe bring, we're going to bring, you know, Dutch culture to you or British culture to you. Um, it's not the missionaries per se. So what would happen is those countries, those empires really, uh, uh, again, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the English were kind of the big ones in the last, uh, you know, 400, 500 years. When they have when they've done that, it made a way for missionaries to come, and they'd often tag along with those uh, those colonizers. But at the same time, they were they were often the ones who were um, uh, talking about how um, you know God made man in His image, and so we can't say that these people in this country are are less uh, a lesser race, a lesser being than us white people. That's not the case, and so. Sometimes historically, the missionaries who were maybe fighting for, um, you know, seeing other races justly and equally and were, were lumped in with colonizers who, uh, especially in the later 1800s, picked up uh, evolutionary ideas and decided that these people are less evolved than us. That's not a missionary idea. That's a, that's a Darwinist idea. The missionaries were, were often saying, no, you're, you're treating these people wrong. But then his history has lumped in the missionaries with the abusers uh, and given the missionaries a bad name. That's not to say that there aren't some who are bad missionaries, but we need to really take a bigger view of that. And so I think Robert Woodbury is one of the best uh, to look at that if that's something that's uh, been difficult for you or has been difficult to defend or has bothered you. Okay. Um, all right. We talk about evangelism. We can talk about evangelism both near and far. And so there's evangelism that we can do across the street with somebody. Uh, uh, we could do it at our in our house. We could do it with somebody in our family. That's all. That's all sharing the gospel. That's all evangelism, which is a biblical term um, that comes from the term gospel. And so we're we're gospelizing people. We're we're bringing the gospel to them. We're sharing it with them. Uh, the terms Great Commission and missions are not in the Bible, but we made them up to kind of help us have a, a way to describe the Great Commission, the, the, this last thing that Jesus left us to do, and missions, which our church would define as a cross-cultural uh, evangelism. 
so that it's not we wouldn't say that it's it's missions just to go you know to my my brother at thanksgiving that's evangelism but missions take something more because if i'm going to take the gospel to all peoples somebody has to go cross culturally and i want to i want to kind of leave you on that with this thought here and that is that there are so many people both individuals and entire groups entire um villages and entire uh, just cultures, languages that literally have never heard the name Jesus, the gospel, anything. So what often happens when we have this discussion is that people say, what about all the needs here? There are needs here. There are absolutely needs for the gospel here, but there's also so much access here that if people really want to hear um, they, they can, and we should continue to build relationships and share, but we need to have God's heart for those who never are going to hear the gospel unless somebody goes. That's what Romans tells us, actually. It says, how will they hear unless uh, we preach, and how will we preach unless we are sent? And so we need to, Jesus says, pray uh, to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send workers because the, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so we want to take the gospel out to where it has not yet been. Couldn't God just give people dreams? Uh, I believe he does that at times, but even dreams are not the same as a full understanding of what the gospel is, who Jesus is, and what he offers, and what it is to follow him, and what it is to, to make a church that follows him together. And so God sends us uh, to these places. Um, and so I really want us to be challenged when we think that this is not my uh, area. It may not be your, your uh, you may not get on an airplane. You may not get on an airplane. You may not learn, learn a la another language, but this is the mission for the entire church uh, all around the world, locally and globally. And so it becomes our mission when we follow Jesus. We not only follow him into salvation, we follow him into his purposes. And clearly, um, the purpose that he left for us is to take the gospel all around the world. And so we also uh, need to be part of that in some way, in some way, uh, because people are, are dying and not knowing the name of Jesus at all, never having heard it at all. Okay. Um, all right. Styles of evangelism. So on the other hand, when we are talking about locally, right, it could be... Um, um, I have, uh, I have, uh, one of my neighbors, one of my neighbors that I am, um, praying and looking for opportunities to share with, um, and it's not really worked out real well yet, but I'm, I'm, uh, that's, that's my desire. Um, and so what are your styles of evangelism? This could be, this could be right across the street. Uh, these are a few, and, uh, this is from a book called Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World by Rebecca Pippert. Um, Brian really likes this book, and I really thought these were really helpful. Really took some pressure off me because some of these are not me at all, and uh, some are. And so it really helps, I think, finding what, what's your style? What's the best way that you can share the gospel? So the first one is confrontational. And each of these have a biblical example there, which I won't look up and read, but you can, you can look, them, look at them there. But sharing possibly uncomfortable truth directly. Some people are really good at being really direct without being offensive and pushing people away unnecessarily. The gospel might push people away, but it shouldn't be because you're a jerk, right? And so some people are just gifted that way. I knew a guy um, that he could say just about anything to anybody, and it could be tough, but he had a way of saying it that people would be like, okay, okay. Um, so are you more kind of uh, direct and bold and confrontational? Uh, more intellectual, maybe. Maybe you, you, you use logic and kind of compare worldviews and say, well, if you believe that, then this is where that leads. But because we believe this, this is where that leads. And let's compare those two ideas. Maybe you're more intellectual. You, you, you do it more from a logical point of view. Maybe you're more testimonial. You're, you're really able to share well what Christ has done in your life and you share your story well. Um, and, and that can be a really powerful thing because it's hard for people to argue against what God has done in your life. Maybe you're more relational, uh, building friendships with the hope of engaging. What can be the, the downfall of this as a side note is that sometimes we can be only relational and only friends and never get around to the gospel. But if we're really sharing our lives with somebody and our lives are centered around Jesus, we're pretty quickly going to have to start sharing Jesus because that's the center of our life. Okay. 
Uh, are you more invitational, maybe offering someone to come to your house or come to church? Um, you know, are you just the kind of, you're hospitable and would you like to come have dinner with me and my family? And then at dinner, we, hey, we, we always pray before our meal and we do it to thank the Lord, but I also want to pray for you. Can I pray for you um, while, I'm, while I'm praying for the food? Maybe, maybe you're more of an invite, inviter, invitational kind of person. Maybe you're more of a servant. Maybe you, you take somebody's trash cans in and, and they wonder why. And you say, well, actually, I, I don't do this because of me or you. I actually do this because of Jesus, what he's done for me and, and what I know he wants to do for you. And so it's really not ultimately about trash cans. Um, actually, I'd love to share for you, with you um, what, what I think God wants to do in your life, which is um, forgiveness of everything that we've ever done wrong. And I've experienced that, and that's why I serve, and that's why I do what I do. Uh, maybe you're more of that servant kind of heart. Uh, whatever it is, I think find yours and see if, uh, see if you can start finding ways to practice that. When I said you don't have to get on an airplane, merely by being part of our church, whether it's praying, giving, um, helping other people go, there's lots of ways. Uh, you can come to, we have a monthly prayer night for our missionaries and, and missions endeavors. Uh, you can uh, ask me or Pastor Larry and we can get you hooked up using your, your skill or whatever, uh, who, whatever you have available to you, even if it's just some time. Uh, in order to serve the Great Commission, because I want to say this, people misunderstand this a lot. We're not saying that everybody should get on an airplane and go to another country and plant a church. No, 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 no. What we're saying is everybody in some way is part of the Great Commission. Uh, one, one gentleman I really respect used the analogy one time of an aircraft carrier, where if our job as an aircraft carrier is to launch the gospel out and launch people to take the gospel out, like we launch airplanes on an aircraft carrier, it doesn't mean that the person who cooks the food for the person uh, who, um, you know, hooks up the, the steam catapult for the pilot who's being launched is any less part of the, the, the purpose of the, the aircraft carrier just because you cook food. We need that. So the person here who is, who is faithfully praying or faithfully giving or who is picking up missionaries from the airport or who is... Um, you know, putting together, you know, fixing a computer to send to a missionary. You may not get on the airplane, but you're just as much part of what God is doing in the Great Commission. So I, I want to kind of clarify that here, that you have a global reach merely by being part of and serving in uh, that capacity in some way here at Calvary Marietta. All right. Uh, your homework is to go to our missions page there. And just learn a little bit about our heart for missions. Who are our missionaries? Just go take a look. Uh, not hard homework to go to a website and just, just browse around a little bit. You can ask me questions. Uh, you can ask Pastor Larry, our missions pastor, questions. Um, but um, I would say this too. Let me say this to you. And I always say that I'm, I'm Bilbo Baggins, uh, who gets kind of pulled along on an adventure. I'm the guy who loves to be at home with a good book inside, and I like my coziness and my TV and my snacks, and that's me. And yet, uh, the Lord has consistently pulled me out of that, sometimes to places I never thought I would go, sometimes to meet people I never thought I would meet, to do things I never thought I would do. Um, and God had to grow and cultivate that in me, but at the same time, um, I can never look back. I can never go back to a Christianity that was about me and my salvation or that um, never extended past sharing with a person here in Marietta. Um, the Lord is doing amazing things around the world. That is his purpose. And we get to, we get the privilege of being part of that. And if you would uh, challenge yourself to just say, Lord, okay, if that's what's so important to you, what do you have for me in that? I'll do it and just see what happens. Just see what happens. We'll see you next time.